Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is my lovely fourth period AP Bio class. Say hi. Fourth hi. This is my lovely third period <laughs> AP Bio class. Say hi. 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 And um, we are missing our Emma today. So Emma, this one's for you. Um, backing it up now, we have already discussed, this is chapter 20, Viruses, Bacteria, and Archaea. We have already discussed virus, viral structure. We've talked about the lytic and the lysogenic cycles, compared and contrasted animal <coughs> viruses with retroviruses, and we have talked about, reviewed, because we learned this already, the characteristics of bacterial cells. So where we are right now is a very important part of this. This is a new thing about bacteria that we have not talked about everything about it previously, just a couple of them. And that has to do with how do bacteria get variety in their genes? Well, one of probably the most easy way for them to get variety is through a what? What am I doing? Mutation. Yes, through a mutation. I was mutating, clearly. Okay, so it's through some mutation in your genes. And we can get mutations in our genes. But a lot of our variety comes from, in eukaryotic cells, comes through the formation of gametes because through, we have sexual reproduction making haploid cells. Two haploid gets, cells get together and form a diploid zygote. Bacterial cells, they do primarily asexual reproduction. Only when the environment starts to change do they do any sexual reproduction. But ours is always sexual. So where can the variety come from in a eukaryotic cell? It could come from what? Crossing over, Crossing over. Independent, independent assortment, assortment and then yeah, fertilization. You know what sperm is going to fertilize what egg and mutation, right? So for a bacterial cell, how do they get new genes? How do they evolve? One, mutation. Another way, we've already talked about this, the process of transformation. This is when that bacterium picks up DNA from its environment. Who did an experiment that we looked at for this? Griffith. Griffith. And what was Griffith using? Mice, rats, and bacteria, right? Remember there were two strains. What were the two strains? R, R and S. And which one was lethal? S. S, yeah. So the S strain was causing death, but if we mixed a heat killed S with a live R, the R came transformed by the S, yes? So that's transformation. That's one way to get new genes. We have already talked about that, transformation. The second one is through conjugation. How does one bacterium get its DNA, maybe in the form of a plasmid, um, from one bacterial cell to another bacterial cell? Using a what? Sexolus. You already know about that. Okay. So it's just going from one bacterium through the sex pillus. In this conjugation, I don't like this diagram because it's not showing you the sex pillus, but you know there's one there, right? Then, yes? Yes, or it makes a copy of it. You don't have to learn this anymore, but it's called an HFR um, plasmid, and it's that particular plasmid. Sometimes what happens when you have that plasmid, that sex plasmid, you're referred to as plus, and when you don't have the plasmid, you are a negative. Sometimes a plus can become a negative as a result of that conjugation because he can, that he, there's no he, the cell can lose its plasmid, or it could have copied it. And so when one has a sex with sex, they become two pluses as a result of it. They each have the, the plasmid in them. Does that make sense? Okay. Third way, and the reason why we couldn't bring this up before is because we had not really discussed viruses before. So here's a little bacteriophage. Now you know if you have a virus, and um, it is in the lysogenic, if it's a lysogenic <coughs> cycle, then it's taking its viral genome and inserting it into the what? Host what? Host yeah, the first host, right? Right, because it's going in there. Now, when it leaves the lysogenic cycle and re-enters the biosynthesis. biosynthesis stage of the lytic cycle, okay, when it does that, it might pick up a few genes from host number one and incorporate it into its viral genome. So now it not only has its original viral genes, but some of host one's DNA. Now it does lysis, bursts out, infects a second bacterium, 
and it becomes goes into the lysogenic cycle, it can bring only not only its viral genome, but DNA from host number one. Okay? And when that occurs, that's called transduction. Not it. Pass or play summarizes three ways besides mutations, bacteria can um, get new genes and variety. Go. Quick. Okay, come back to me. Um, reproduction in prokaryotes, primarily, right, they will do asexual reproduction, binary fission. Here's what it actually looks like. So binary fission clones of offspring. I can't remember if we, I gave you these notes before, but did I? Okay, perfect. Okay, um, but it's, tell why this can increase a lot of variety that they're haploid. Tell, I already gave you those notes, go ahead. Because it's haploid, it has a short generation time, mutations are generated and passed on quicker and natural selection is quicker. Okay, then, <laughs> okay, genetic variation and recombination, we have conjugation, use a pillus to pass a plasmid. Pillus to pass a plasmid. Transformation, pick up new pieces of DNA from the environment. Transduction, virus acts as a vector of new DNA. Virus acts as a vector of new DNA. All right, now, Let's talk about um, something we already learned. We know we have a cell membrane, a phospholipid bilayer. We know the cell wall in a bacterial cell is peptidioglycan. What is it in a plant? Cellulose. Cellulose. What is it in fungus? Chitin. Chitin. Good. Okay. So now there's variations on this wall. This variation, there was a man named Graham, and so that he came up with something called Graham's stain. Okay, so it's not gram like mass, but his name. And some bacteria stained well, and some bacteria did not stain well. Keep in mind, when classification was taking place, you could barely tell differences. Remember, when I went to school, there was no archaea discussions in school. That is new. I was teaching for many years before we started talking about archaea and looking at those differences between prokaryotes. But one of the initial ways to differentiate between prokaryotes are if they took the gram stain or they didn't take the gram stain. So taking a look at this picture right here, one was called gram positive and one was called gram negative. Um, if you look at here, you can see the cytoplasm is the tan, the cell membrane, the cell membrane is that darker tan, and then the peptidioglycan is the purple. Okay, so that's all we've talked about before is cell membrane, cell wall. So, yes, I want to continue. Okay, so if you just have that peptidioglycan, it stains very well, and that's called gram-positive bacteria. But in this scenario, you have your cell membrane, cell wall, and then you have on top of that cell wall a lipopolysaccharide. Let's try to figure out what a lipopolysaccharide is. It is probably a lipid and a carbohydrate of some sort, right? Does that make sense? As a result of that extra layer, it does not stain well, and that whole group of bacteria are called gram-negative. Why do you care? Well, if you don't care about classification, you probably don't care that much. That was just a way to differentiate them. It was an arbitrary process. But here is a reason why you might care. When you have bacteria that are invading your body and they are making you sick, what do you try to take? An antibiotic to help kill off that bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria, the ones that don't stain well because they have that lipopolysaccharide, are harder to kill. Does that make sense? Because they have that extra layer. Because what antibiotics do in general are two big categories. They either interfere with some sort of protein production or anything cell wall, making more, like if that cell was gonna make more cells that were gonna invade your body, 
or cell wall repair. So because they have that extra layer on there, that makes them more resistant to antibiotics. Um, and so they're harder to kill. Okay. So here's another picture. Not it. And just, you can see the, the details of it. Go ahead and exp, you know, explain, just point it out. I don't care, whichever one of you want that one, go. Okay, I'm back in. So characteristics of bacteria, cell wall composed of peptidioglycan, a combination of carbs and amino acids, two types of walls, all related to their ability to stain and was an early differentiation tool. If you are gram positive, you are thick walled, trap stained, which shows a purple. Thick walled, trap stained, and purple. Gram negative, thin walled, I gave you everything there, right? Did I add in the outer membrane blocks antibiotic drug infection sickle tree? Okay, good. All right, then you can see in the mini me portion of it, oh wait, I think I have another picture, yes. Okay, and here's an, just another picture showing gram positive versus gram negative. We're not gonna, it just also throws on there the capsule layer that can be on the outermost part of it. Remember how we said it could be hard or slimy or whatever? Do you remember that part? Okay, so shapes. We don't have to memorize the shapes anymore, and that's why it's mini me. Spirilla um, looks like a spiral. Um, bacillus is rod shaped. Coxus is sphere shaped. If you see Staphylococcus, if you had a staph infection, it's a it's a bunch of chains of sphere shaped bacteria that are living in your um, throat as a parasite. Okay, all right. Then um, that's why that's small. Bacterial metabolism. So take a look at this. We can relate it to oxygen issues. Some of them, they don't even care about oxygen. So if we look here, you can see obligate aerobes. So obligate means you have to, right? Obligated. And aero aerobe sounds like aerobic respiration. So look where the bacteria are congregating. Okay. Start with the youngest bio, but it ping pong back and forth with the remaining three. Why does that make sense? Go ahead. <laughs> Okay. Come back to me. So oxygen, most are what? What are most bacteria? Aerobic. And they do cellular respiration. Okay, with oxygen. So that would be aerobic cellular respiration, right? Who, who does cellular respiration? All cells. But most do it aerobically, okay? Um, facultative anaerobes live with, that, with or without. Obligate anaerobes, no oxygen. Um, autotrophic bacteria. Autotrophs, if they're phototrophs, what do they use? They gotta use light. If you're a phototroph, you, you are going to use light. Chemoautotrophs. And we've studied these before a little bit. Chemo, I think, did we? No? Like, have you ever been to a um, natural hot springs? Does anybody, do you know what it smells like in a natural hot springs? Sulfur, Sulfur rotten eggs. That's because um, chemoautotrophs are breaking down hydrogen sulfide, H2S, and they're using the bond between the hydrogen and the sulfur to give them the energy to fix their carbon. Like, we use, or we, plants, photoautotrophs use what? Light for their source of energy. They're using the energy and bond in order for them to be autotrophs. Okay? So a different source of energy for a similar process. So that would be chemoautotrophs. Oxidized inorganic compounds. Oxidized inorganic compounds to gain energy, to gain energy to reduce carbon dioxide. Oxidize inorganic compounds to gain energy to reduce carbon dioxide. Okay. Heterotrophs. Heterotrophs have to take in preformed organic nutrients. You are a heterotroph. Okay. You are a chemo heterotroph. You go and 
heat thing, either plant material or food material. So hemoheterotrophs obtain of organic nutrients. Um, Saprotrophs are a type of chemoheterotroph that acts as a decomposer in an ecosystem. That acts as a decomposer in an ecosystem. Youngest bio buddy, just explain this page real quick. Go ahead, youngest bio buddy. <laughs> I know none of these are bacteria, and this is a chapter on viruses and bacteria, but I was trying to relate these bacterial um, words to words that maybe would be more easily recognizable, so some act in all of these different roles, okay, including plant life. Um, there are many um, prokaryotic products um, that we use. Maybe you use soy sauce or Worcestershire sauce or yogurt or any of these things um, that you like to eat. Um, a big, big thing that prokaryotes do for us is they recycle nutrients, so they act as what starts with a D? Decomposers, that's critical. All right, now, bacteria can enter into relationships with other organisms other than itself, um, and examples of that that we're gonna go through and we talked about yesterday in the review um, were symbiotic relationships. Now, there are more than three symbiotic relationships out there, many more. I am just um, holding you accountable for these three. The key thing about a symbiotic relationship is it has to be two different species. So you and I are not in a symbiotic relationship. You might think it, it's like I'm providing an education and your parents' tax dollars are giving me what? Money, right? So it's like win-win for both, except we are the same what? Species. Now, if you have a relationship with your dog, that would be a symbiotic relationship if you have a dog or a pet. Decide which of these best represents your relationship with your dog. Go ahead. <laughs> now, if your dog is one of your best buddies, okay, that is a mutualistic relationship. We had a chocolate lab, and my oldest son picked it out. He loved the chocolate lab. It was definitely mutualistic. They both, you know, he loved the dog, took care of the dog, fed the dog, and the dog loved him, okay? We also adopted a dog from a um, rescue dog, devil dog Jack, who was evil, okay? And that was my youngest son's dog. That was definitely a parasitic relationship. He was a taker. He started getting Harley, um, who never pooed in the house. He was pooing, not only was he pooing, but in the what I called the white room, which is like the special living room where you're like holidays and guests, right? But you don't go in. Yeah, he, and he was getting him to go on field trips throughout the day and he, he was climbing fences, little devil dog Jack, and like opening up the fence for Harley and then they would go off for the day. It was crazy, that dog was like possessed, okay? And he would act like he was asleep and lay his little head next to my um, youngest son in bed because he knew he as soon as Jacob went to sleep, we would take the dog out. So he would act like he's asleep and he would like peek to see if you're going to come take him. He died of rat poison. I'm super sorry about that. Okay, it was an accident. Okay, commensalism, it was. He went to the neighbors, he went on a field trip and ate a rat poison. We just couldn't get him to the vet fast enough. Okay, commensalism, sorry, that's recorded for all time. Jacob, I hope you're not listening to this. Okay, be brave. Okay, um, commensalism, hashtag mom fail. Um, commensalism is where it makes no difference. This would be like, you have a dog that your family got for you, but you don't really care if the dog, you know, somebody else takes care of it, you don't have to pick up the poo, you don't even mind. That would be commensalism. So here are three scenarios, decide which one is which, and then also answer the question. If you were here in the review yesterday, we talked about this, go. I'm 
What is number one? Mutualism. What is number two, probably? Commensalism. There's nothing really in there to help you understand that, other than number three is parasitism. Why is this not a good model? Same species. Same species. Good. Now, you have all the notes for this already. What you could add to your notes are examples of these relationships. There are so many examples in nature. I'm going to give you examples of... Um, I'm giving you... I am giving you examples of bacterial examples of these, but there are so many in nature, and I want to give you just a couple ones in nature. Um, for mutualism, um, there are monkeys and deer who are in mutualistic relationships. And for the monkeys, they climb up into the trees and they eat food. And while they're eating their food up in the trees, they drop branches down for the deer to eat. Okay, so what are the deer getting out of that relationship? branches food to eat but here's how what the monkey gets when the monkey doesn't have any more food in that tree it climbs down the tree has to kind of waddle across the ground and then climb up another tree okay when they're down on the ground they are what vulnerable, vulnerable. the deer when they have predators of the monkey around the deer stomp their feet and then that warns the monkeys not to climb down out of the tree does that make sense okay there are a lot of cleaning relationships out there that are mutualistic where a bird let's say picks ticks off of a giraffe now that sounds mutualistic and for the most part it is because the giraffe gets the ticks off of it and the bird gets a little tasty snack but sometimes what the bird does is he pulls the ticks off and when he does it starts to what a little bit bleed a little bit he keeps the sore open and drinks the blood now all of a sudden something that was mutualistic just got a little bit of what parasitic parasitic right another example nemo what kind of fish is nemo clownfish all when i was growing up because where does nemo live in a sea anemone right and so the idea of what i learned growing up was that it was a commensalistic relationship because nemo got the protection of the sea anemone and a place to live but the sea anemone didn't get anything out of it. That has been now revisited as science gets better, and now we know that the waste of Nemo, of the clownfish, that those nitrogens that are released, those nitrates that are released, are used by the sea anemone, so therefore it is a what kind of relationship? Mutualistic, okay? The ones I'm showing you here are all examples of bacterial relationships, and oldest bio buddy, lead off with this one. Go ahead. Okay, now when we get to our eighth and final unit, which is ecology, you will learn about the nitrogen cycle. I'm just going to precursor it here for you right now. Take a big breath in, let it out. Over 70% of the gas that you just inhaled in your lungs was nitrogen, N2. It's inert. It doesn't make you stronger. It doesn't fill up your belly. We cannot use nitrogen gas, nor can any plant or animal. Who can use N2 are nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Nitrogen-fixing bacteria will take N2 and convert it into ammonia, which is NH3. Then another set of bacteria needs to kick in, nitrifying bacteria. They convert NH3 into nitrite, which is NO2 minus, and other nitrifying bacteria convert um, the NO2 minus nitrite into NO, um, NO3 minus, which is nitrate. Nitrate is what plants can use. We eat plants or animals who have eaten plants in order to get our nitrates in our body. Does that make sense? So it's a whole series of bacteria that need to do this. This process of nitrogen fixation is an anaerobic process. It will not work in the presence of oxygen. So therefore, these bacteria, cyanobacteria, okay, hallmark of, you know, poster child of bacteria, do them in these little root nodules that are in the plant. What does the plant get out of it? The plant gets nitrates. 
Okay, what does the bacteria get out of it? Sugars from the plant. Win-win for not only the plant, but all life on Earth. Okay? Um, there is another way to fix nitrogen, and that's called atmospheric fixation. Uh, um, and this would be lightning, fixing N2 directly into nitrate. And also man has the ability to do it it's, uh, in through making fertilizers and things like that. Okay, so this is a very critical role. Think about where we use nitrogen just in your four important organic molecules. Oh Lord, come on now. Proteins, right? Proteins have nitrogen in them, right? The amino group, right? Where else? Another one, really important. What? Bases, right? Nitrogenous bases in a nucleotide, right? Adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil, those all contain nitrogen. If we don't have that, then we don't have either one of those components. All right, next, switch, other bio buddy, take on this one, go ahead. <laughs> So if we don't care, if it's just living in there and it's not making us sick or harming us, then it could be commensalistic. Probably more along the lines of mutualistic by if that bacteria that doesn't make us sick is there, then there are no vacancies for bacteria that what? Would make us sick. That's why if you take a regimen of antibiotics, ladies in the room, okay, you, as soon as you finish your antibiotics, you want to eat something like what? Yogurt. Yogurt to reestablish the colonies of the good bacteria, the harmless bacteria, so that the harmful bacteria doesn't come. Because it's very easy to follow up a series of um, antibiotics with a urinary tract infection or a yeast infection in your hoo-ha. Okay, so that's why you want to have yogurt after that. Okay, switch yet again. Go ahead. All right, and then um, here, um, why don't you each pick your favorite uh, bacterial disease, pick two favorites, and share it with your bio buddy. All right, and pick one off this one too. That's fun. Okay, now. Some bacteria that are parasitic have the ability to form what's called these endospores, where they're kind of like a water bear, and they totally dehydrate, right, just down to the nucleus, and then they can stay that way literally for a thousand years, okay, some of them. And then they can be used then as weapons. <laughs> um, so the anthrax, right, is a bacterium, smallpox is a virus, the plague is a bacterium, botulism is a toxin, so they can last for a really long time. Yes? When you say weapon, do you mean like you shoot a virus at somebody? Uh, shoot a pathogen at someone, release it like in a bomb, a mist, or something, a building, in an envelope that you mail to someone. Yeah, no, that has been done, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, now, um, some other concerns um, is, and this is actually a part of our natural selection unit. So when I say remember back, because I'm going to say I already taught you this, but it's actually not one of your enduring understandings until next unit. And this is our artificial selection we are doing by our proliferation of really weak antibiotics and lotions and creams and things like that and hand sanitizer, right? You didn't get a pres prescription for your hand sanitizer, did you? Mm -hmm. No. So it is a very weak antibiotic, but it's killing off the what ones? Weak ones. And which ones now have room to go? Strong ones. Okay, that is a form of artificial selection. Okay, the more antibiotics you expose your body to, um, in your lifetime, the fewer antibiotics you will have to save you later because your body will develop resistance to it. And then there's also the herd mentality, 
right? Because what will happen is maybe I'm really good or you're really good with your antibiotics, but she is taking them left and right. Because we're exposed to her, we end up picking up the bad bacteria that she has been cultivating in her body through the misuse of antibiotics. Does that make sense? And like I said before, their purpose is either to interfere with the bacterial's ability to do protein synthesis or cell wall formation and repair. All right, so that is good on that, okay? I think I gave you a whole thing on antibiotics. And then, um, oh, no, there's one other thing. Mind you, this is in pounds. Um, youngest Bob, did he talk about this right here? Now, if you're wondering about the pound, I'm, I'm actually going to London and, and over spring break, so I happened to look it up, and it's about, I think it's like a dollar thirty. Like a pound is worth like it takes us a dollar thirty to buy one pound. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is more than 66 trillion. I think somebody put it in the converter during first period, and it was something like 70. What is it? trillion probably yeah so that that to me is a lot of money and we need to start addressing it keep in mind um, keep in mind antibiotics are used in meat right animals there is an, just a proliferation of it and it's it's that's that's gonna have an effect right on what bacteria are surviving now poster child of all ba of bacteria, if I was gonna pick one and say this one's most important, I would pick the cyanobacteria, okay? Because they do so many different things. Remember when I talked to you about nitrogen fixation? They can do that, okay? So that's a big deal. They are photoautotrophs. They generate a whole bunch of oxygen for us. They probably contributed to the oxygen revolution about 2.3 billion years ago. So nitrogen, oxygen, these are like really critical things for life. Um, that we need. If you looked at just what they do to agricultural fields, why don't you pick a couple to share with your bio buddy? Go. Mm -hmm. Okay, now come back to me. Do you remember how I told you the process of nitrogen fixation has to occur in an anaerobic environment? Okay, it's heterocysts, or what they're called, where that takes place in the root nodules. And plants who have that symbiotic relationship are so quantitatively, you know, chi-square significantly healthier than ones who don't have that relationship with the cyanobacteria. So on your notes, cyanobacteria, unusual and important. They are gram-negative bacteria. Oldest bio buddy, Tom, what does it mean to be gram-negative? And they are probably responsible for the oxygen revolution. Number two, they are nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Nitrogen-fixing bacteria. There are many symbiotic relationships. One would be a lichen, um, plus all the other ones I showed you. A lichen is a symbiotic relationship between, with an algae or a cyanobacterium with a fungus. Lichen can be flat on rocks, they can be raised on rocks, but what they do is they um, contribute to breaking down rocks to create soil. Um, and then number four can cause algal, A-L-G-A-L, blooms. By and large, algal blooms are not a positive thing. It's like uh, w way high production of too many algae, which when you think about it this way, you might think, well, oh, algae are doing photosynthesis, so awesome, you're producing what? A lot of oxygen, which might be good for a body of water. But what happens is, Whatever caused the algal bloom, what set it off, usually is not sustainable. And then the algae do what? They die. When the algae die, who works on them? Starts with a D. Decomposers. Or detritivores, sure. Decomposers work on them. Decomposers do aerobic respiration. 
So as the decomposers are breaking down that algal bloom, what are they removing from the body of water? Oxygen, which then causes massive fish kill because they cannot do aerobic respiration. Okay, so algal blooms, any bloom of algae, usually in a body of water, not a positive thing. So that would be a downside if that happens. Okay, now, um, changing gears a little bit. We, we earlier, I didn't in this presentation that I'm recording right now, but earlier, let me just try to get a picture really quick. We talked about bacterial structures, so you wanna go back and review bacterial structures because it's not in this presentation, um, but um, plasmids, all of those things. But then after bacteria, um, we wanna talk about the third domain, and that third domain is archaea. Now, I know this just looks like a wall of words because it is a wall of words, okay? This is a classification table, but I wanted to point some things out to you that were good about this. It's just a picture from your book. If you look up here, there's domain bacteria, and in orange down here is domain archaea. What is the third domain? Eukarya. Why did you hesitate on that? Eukarya, right? Those are the three domains, right? If you look at the characteristics of domain bacteria, which we have been talking about, just listen to the characteristics as I read them aloud. Prokaryotic, unicellular organisms that lack membrane organelles, you know that. Reproduce asexually, that means primarily. You can, you can use also a conjugation pillus. Metabolically diverse, a mini being heterotrophic by absorption. So they're not doing ingestion like we do, they're absorbing their nutrients, okay? Like the ones that live in your body. Others are autotrophic by chemosynthesis um, or photosynthesis. The ones that are autotrophic by photosynthesis, the key one there would be cyanobacteria. Um, motile forms move by flagella consisting of a single filament. If you look at the next differentiation, can you read that, what that says up there? Yeah, so they categorize them by gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive and then other. Okay, jumping down to domain back, um, archaea, let's contrast the two. Still prokaryotic, same, same. Unicellular organisms, same. Reproduce asexually, same. Archaea, metabolically diverse, many being not heterotrophic, but autotrophic. Okay, so that's different, not heterotrophic, but autotrophic by chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis, so they're not using light, they're breaking down, they are chemoautotrophs, right? Um, so they're breaking down something and then using that um, in order to synthesize their nutrients. A few by photosynthesis, some being heterotrophic by absorption. They are distinguished from bacteria by their unique rRNA. What is rRNA used to build? Ribosomes. Ribosomes and their distinctive plasma membrane and cell wall chemistry. The difference in their cell membrane and cell wall enables them to live in what? Extreme. Extreme environments. Very good. So underneath your overview, you have all of that in one and two. Can you see that? Okay. Then I just want to just visit a couple of different varieties of archaea. So remember, they're going to live in these extreme environments. One of the, oh, here, here, coming back here. This is just showing you the differences um, and looking at archaea, um, archaebacteria as compared to gram-positive bacteria. Are you looking? Okay, versus gram-negative bacteria. So one of the, one group are called methanogens. Not it. Not it, pass or play, talking about methanogens. Go ahead, quickly. <laughs> Are you reading this part down here? <laughs> more methanogens means more methane, which could contribute to global warming. That's the argument against cows, right? Because we have way more cows. We we support way more cows in our man-made environments than there would be naturally, right? And all of those cows have meth methanogens in them generating methane, which can affect global warming or whatever. Okay? I'm just telling you that's where that argument comes from. 
So methanogens are chemoheterotrophs, chemoheterotrophs. They are obligate anaerobes. They produce methane, and they may be found on Mars one day. Maybe that would be an early colonizer of Mars. Okay, here is another one, halophiles. They live in really, really salty environments like Salt Lake um, in Utah or Mono Lake or the Dead Sea. Um, they are aerobic chemoheterotrophs requiring high salt concentration. And then some do this really modified photosynthesis. And then we have thermoacidophil, as a thermoacidophil, spills means, means like, right, love. Thermo means they must want a hot temperature with a low pH, okay? These are what you see at um, like Yellowstone and things like that where you see the water and the colorful water. Um, you're looking at thermoacidophils. So chemoautotrophic anaerobes living in hot acidic environments. And then some might live in more moderate environments and in symbiotic relationships, but they are never parasitic. They do not cause disease, and they may be a major producer of nitrite in the ocean. Nitrite in the ocean. Now, on that, I just want to remind you, it's still cyanobacteria who are big contributors to nitrogen fixation to get it from N2 to NH3, but you still have to do nitrification, converting the ammonia once it's fixed into NO2 minus, which is <coughs> nitrite, okay? So they play a role in the process of moving nitrogen through our ecosystem and the bio, biotic community. Okay, hopefully you walked out that door. And today we are gonna log in is our, of our, uh, with our biggest um, hurdle of the week. Biggest hurdle of the week for you. What do you have to get over? Oh, when's your academic, yeah, that was, this looks a lot like first period. Um, when is your academic, academica? On Saturday, okay. Where are you for that? Um, Calabasas. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, no, this is the guy's school. Oh, okay. Procrastination, yes, that is a big hurdle. And here's the question, you can answer it at home. Emma, are you doing that? <laughs> it's gonna be like, yelling at me the whole time. It's only because we love you. Okay, let's finish up. Let's go biotest, whichever one of you it is. <laughs> Waiting to be ungrounded. Probably if you spelled grounded better, you might get off faster. <laughs> that is so sad. Okay, let's see how you did. which is not true of prokaryotes, so they do contain a nucleus. Okay, what is that one? Why did somebody miss that one? Because that's an obvious. What did they do? They misread the question, okay? Um, which is not true of prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria? Archaea and bacteria are, that's true. They are both prokaryotes, okay? But most of you got that, okay? Here's just a picture, again, of the three domains and, um, just a little review of that. Okay, so I hope this was helpful. Um, have a piece of toast. Emma, get better. And Emma, there's another video yet today on development. Okay, make good choices.